Good evenings, Mother Factors. My name is Sam, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about Rome. But not just any Rome. Ancient Rome. Yes, you're about to learn all about aqueducts, gladiators, and several important hills. It's gonna be epic. But which rude body part did the Romans use as a good luck charm? Here's a clue, it's not the weenus. Why did some Roman emperors deliberately drink poison? And do all roads really lead to Rome? My street just leads to a sewage treatment facility. <laughs> what? London's expensive. Anyway, two out of three of those questions are going to be answered. So put on your toga, slip on your sandals, and pursue a regime of voracious imperialism as we count through 101 facts about ancient Rome. Before we get started though, remember to do the ancient Roman ritual of subscribing to the channel. Subscribus, mother factus. That's what it was called back then. It's a similar thing, just please like and subscribe, thanks. Anyway. Number one. Ancient Rome was the Roman civilization that existed from the founding of the city of Rome in the 8th century BC, leading all the way to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. This encompasses the Roman Kingdom, the Roman Republic, and the Roman Empire until the fall of the Western Empire. Though sometimes the term Ancient Rome is restricted to only the eras of the Roman Kingdom and the Roman Republic. Number two. The famous myth surrounding the founding of Rome involves two semi-divine infant twin boys, Romulus and Remus, who were suckled by a she-wolf after being left to die on the banks of the river Tiber. The two grew up and decided to found their own settlement, but after a dispute over where exactly to start building, Romulus killed Remus, and the resulting city would eventually be called Rome after the surviving brother. Number 3 the more likely origin of the city of Rome is that it grew from settlements around a fort on the river Tiber. Archaeological evidence suggests that the village of Rome was founded by members of an Italic tribe called the Latins, on top of the Palatine Hill at some point in the 8th century BC. However, some believe the settlement may date as far back as the 10th century BC. Number 4. Over a period of several centuries, the city expanded into one of the largest empires in the ancient world. There have been several estimates of how many people were ruled over by the Romans, the traditional figure is somewhere around 55 million, though some estimates put that number as high as 120 million. Number 5. Through conquest and assimilation, the Roman Empire eventually dominated the Mediterranean region, most of Western Europe, parts of Northern and Eastern Europe, Asia Minor and North Africa. At its height in AD 117, the Roman Empire covered an area of roughly 5 million square kilometres. Number 6. Based on modern national boundaries, the Roman Empire stretched across 40 modern countries. One of them was England, which, if you haven't already guessed, is where I'm from. Tune in next time for another obvious fact about Sam. Number 7. As mentioned, the civilization began as a kingdom, then became a republic, and then a vast empire ruled over by emperors. The Roman Empire lasted for 244 years, between 753 and 509 BC, when it was overthrown and replaced with the classical Roman Republic, which lasted until 27 BC, almost twice as long as the regal period. Number 8. The system of government that was created in 509 BC was called the Res Publica, which loosely translates to public affair. This system formed the inspiration for modern republics like the United States and France, which favoured democratically elected leaders over monarchs and autocrats. Number 9. The motto of the ancient Rome Republic and Empire, Senatus Populusque Romanus, meaning the Roman Senate and People, was often abbreviated to SPQR, and is regularly found in ruins and on artefacts. In fact, the letters are even inscribed on manhole covers in present-day Rome. Number 10. Between 264 BC and 146 BC, during the civilization's second era as a republic, Rome fought a series of wars against the ancient Carthaginian Empire, known as the Punic Wars. The Roman Empire was expanding, and, put very simply, the Mediterranean basin just wasn't big enough for the both of them. Rome eventually emerged victorious, because Rome is a boss-ass B-word who doesn't give no Fs. Number 11. The period between 134 BC to 44 BC is often referred to by historians as the Crises of the Roman Republic. As its name suggests, this period in Rome struggled with a variety of problems, such as war with outside forces, slave revolts, land reforms, and even civil wars. Between 49-45 BC, the Great Roman Civil War saw Roman armies fighting each other across Italy, Spain, Greece, and Egypt. Stuff was cray, basically. Number 12. When Julius Caesar, or JJ Caesar as I call him, was young, long before he became the victim of history's most famous shanking in 44 BC, he was kidnapped by pirates while crossing the Aegean Sea. Apparently, Caesar maintained an air of superiority throughout the whole ordeal. He was so arrogant, in fact, that when the pirates declared the amount they wanted as ransom for a safe return, he demanded that they increase it. Jeez, what a diva. Number 13. Interestingly, I'm saying Julius Caesar wrong, 
I know, me saying things wrong doesn't happen often, does it? Comment section. <laughs> Uh, the correct pronunciation of Julius Caesar in ancient Rome was apparently closer to Julius Caesar, but I can't be bothered to say that every time, so I'm just going to keep saying Caesar. Okay, cool. Number 14. In 92 BC, a series of conflicts began that would later be referred to as the Roman-Persian Wars. If taken together, these wars constitute the longest conflict in human history, lasting an incredible 721 years, having major lasting effects and consequences on both sides. Number 15. The Roman Empire began in 27 BC when Octavius appointed himself Augustus, meaning the Exalted One or the Increaser. This period was characterised by an increasingly autocratic empire, with the balance of power shifting from the Roman Senate to the Emperor. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Number 16. On one occasion, when the Roman Emperor Augustus was visiting his friend Pollio, a slave accidentally broke one of his master's crystal cups. Pollio, infamous for his cruelty, attempted to have the man fed to lamprey eels, which totally isn't an overreaction at all. Augustus was so disgusted by his friend's brutality that he not only freed the slave, but had the rest of the man's cup smashed too. <laughs> so petty. Love it. Number 17. At the beginning of the Roman Empire, the realm existed in a period of relative peace known as the Pax Romana, meaning Roman peace. This chapter of ancient Rome lasted for over 200 years, after which the Romans decided to no longer give peace a chance. Peace, I mean, not peas. What did I say that? Oh, God. Number 18. Instead of having a foreign office or an equivalent, the Roman Empire instead had a bureau of barbarians. This sounds insulting, but the term barbarian essentially meant non-Roman, and was used to refer to several groups such as the Celts, Iberians, Berbers, and Parthians. Number 19. Before ascending to power in 10 BC, the Emperor Claudius survived the assassination of his family simply because he had severe disabilities and he was not seen as a threat. Claudius eventually went on to become a capable and effective ruler, and also began the conquest of Britain. Number 20. Between 14 and 37 AD, the Roman Emperor Tiberius banned kissing in an attempt to halt the spread of face disfiguring fungal disease called Mentagra. Number 21. The Roman Emperor Caligula, who became Emperor in 37 AD, was infamous for his alleged cruelty and just generally being a crazy ass motherfucker. Hmm, no demonetization here today. He is rumored to have made his favorite horse, Incitatus, a senator, but in reality that probably didn't happen. There is evidence though that he may have planned to do so, possibly to insult and humiliate his inferiors. Caligula was a dick, basically. Number 22. Oh. Another douchebag, Nero, who became emperor in 54 AD, once married one of his freedmen, Doriferous, and took the role of bride. How progressive, you might say. Later, he married a slave called Sporus, this time in the role of the groom. Not before he'd had Sporus castrated, though. <laughs> nice guy. Number 23. Nero was also infamous for allegedly singing and playing the fiddle while much of the city was engulfed by the Great Fire of Rome. This particular story is manifestly false. Nero wasn't even in Rome at the time of the fire, and the fiddle had not even been invented yet. Number 24. Between 96 to 180 AD, Rome was ruled over by the imperial succession of Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Autonomous Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. These emperors presided over a golden age for the Roman Empire, and are known as the Five Good Emperors, owing to their benevolent dictatorship style, which is also the style with which I run this channel. Right, Clive? Number 25. 238 AD, which is when your mum was born, it's now known as the Year of the Six Emperors. I'm sure you're wondering why. Luckily, I've had my best men on this inscrutable mystery, and we think we've figured it out. Yes, a total of six men were recognised as emperor in that tumultuous year, starting with Maximinus Thrax, who had been ruling since 235 AD. Maximinus Thrax, which is an amazing name, it sounds like an alien name though, doesn't it really, was another Roman emperor known for his capricious brutality, eventually prompting a revolt that created a leadership free-for-all. Gordian I and the second, the father and son team who ruled jointly, lasted only 20 days as emperors. Number 26. In the middle of the 3rd century, the Roman Empire almost collapsed due to the combined pressure of civil war, invasion, economic depression, and plagues in a period known as the Crisis of the 3rd century. They have a lot of crises, these Romans. By 268 AD, the empire split into three competing regions, the Western Gallic Empire, the Eastern Palmyrene Empire, and the Italian-centred Roman Empire nestled snugly in between them. The successes of the Emperor Aurelian helped to reunite the empire, but ultimately something had to keep the state from collapsing. Number 27. At this point, the empire had literally become too vast and unstable to be governed effectively, with messages from the outer reaches of the empire taking weeks to arrive and vice versa. To solve this, the emperor Diocletian split the empire in two, and continued to rule the eastern empire while his friend Maximian ruled the western empire. However, the Romans themselves did not consider the two entities to be literally separate. Number 28. 
The Western Roman Empire lasted for a little under 200 years, a period of time in which it was plagued by internal instability and attacks from various outside groups. Towards the end of the 5th century, the western half of the empire broke up into independent barbarian kingdoms, constituting the official end of that section of the ancient Roman civilization. Number 29. However, the Eastern Roman Empire endured for centuries throughout the medieval era and even regained parts of the fallen Western Empire for certain periods. This empire, which historians refer to as the Byzantine Empire after its capital Byzantium, finally fell in 1453 AD, bringing an end to the last vestiges of the Roman civilization. Number 30. Ultimately though, the Roman civilization survived in various forms for over 2,000 years, and as such exerted significant influence on the very nature of the modern Western world. The ancient Roman Empire contributed to modern law and politics, technology and engineering, architecture, art, literature, religion and language. Kind of like Beyonce. Number 31. Rome was famously split into seven hills, as all the best cities are. These are the Capitoline, Quirinal, Viminal, Esquiline, Caelian, Aventine and Palatine hills. The more you know. Number 32. During the 2nd century, the imperial city of Rome was the largest urban centre in the empire, with a population of more than 1 million inhabitants. No other western city would reach that size until the 19th century. Number 33. Experts believe that at its height, ancient Rome was 8 times more densely populated than present day New York. And it doesn't even have an M&M store either. Number 34. Ancient Roman society was extremely hierarchical, with slaves known as servi at the very bottom. Freedmen, known as Liberty, followed by free-born citizens, known as Kives, at the top. Number 35. Free citizens were also further divided by class. The broadest division separated the patricians, who could trace their ancestry back to the founders of Rome, and the plebeians, who could not. These distinctions became less important in the later Republic, as many of the laws regarding class were relaxed. This allowed some plebeian families to become wealthy and enter politics, while some patrician families, less protected by the earlier, more rigid class structure, fell into poverty and obscurity. Got it. Number 36. Average life expectancy in ancient Rome at certain points was as low as about 28. However, this is skewed somewhat by infant deaths and women dying during childbirth. Individuals who made it past their milestones often lived much longer, closer to modern day lifespans. Number 37. However, the situation was especially grim for slaves in ancient Rome. The average recorded age at death for the slaves during this period could be as low as 17 and a half years old. Number 38. In 2011, archaeologists reported having found the remains of close to 100 infants while excavating a Roman city. The victims are believed to have been smothered and then cast into a sewer that ran beneath a brothel. It's believed that infanticide was actually a largely tolerated and fairly widespread method of limiting family size in the ancient world. Jeez, oh, I said that way too upbeat, didn't I? Number 39. Additionally, Roman society apparently had a relatively permissive attitude towards suicide. If a person wanted to top themselves, they simply made an application to the Senate, who reviewed their reasons for wanting to die. If their petition was approved, they'd be given a free hemlock with which to off themselves. Number 40. One of the most important public roles in ancient Rome was that of the Vestal Virgins. They were responsible for maintaining a sacred fire dedicated to the goddess Vesta, which was not allowed to be extinguished. Number 41. As their name suggests, the Vestal Virgins were bound to celibacy. Gutted. In their role as keepers of the sacred fire, they were considered embodiments of the state, effectively making lovemaking with a citizen incestuous. Offenders would often be buried alive. The meaning of life. Before the Roman Empire was slowly Christianized between the 1st and 4th centuries, Roman religion consisted of a wide variety of deities that were adapted from the earlier Greek polytheism. The various gods and goddesses all ruled over different areas of life, and were prayed to when seeking help or support within those specific categories. It was all very organized. Number 43. As mentioned, the Romans were known for their belief in various gods, but it wasn't just war and agriculture and whatnot for which the people of ancient Rome had specific deities. They also recognized a goddess of sewers, a god of toilets, and, of course, a god of excrement. Not only that, ancient Romans also believed that excrement was food of the dead. Good grief. The empire couldn't have fallen soon enough. Number 44. The native language of the Romans was Latin, an Italic language that posh people have to learn at school. This sentence is for all you cunning linguists out there, by the way. Latin grammar relies very little on word order and rather conveys meaning through a variety of affixes attached to word stems. Number 45. Though the vast majority of surviving Latin literature was written in classical Latin, the highly stylized and polished version of the language, the spoken language of the Roman Empire, was Vulgar Latin, which doesn't have as many swear words as you think it does from that name, but differed significantly from classical Latin both in grammar and vocabulary. Vulgar Latin eventually developed into modern Romance languages like French, Spanish, and Italian. 
Number 46. One of the most notable structures left behind by the Romans is the enormous arena in Rome known as the Colosseum. For centuries, the massive stadium was infamous to use for gladiator and wild animal fights and grisly public executions, as well as reenactments of famous battles and dramas. So, you know, they'd reenact spilling the tea in a Colosseum. That's what kids say these days, right? Spilling tea? I don't understand it either. Number 47. The official name of the Colosseum in Rome, the Flavian Amphitheatre, is so known because it was built during the Flavian dynasty under the rule of Emperor Vespasian. The name Colosseum arrived around the year 1000 AD, long after it ceased to be used. Number 48. Throughout the history of the Colosseum's grisly use, it's thought that over 500,000 people and over a million wild animals were killed. The last gladiatorial fights took place there in 435 AD. Number 49. In 86 AD, the Colosseum was even flooded with water in order to stage a naval battle. And you thought seeing Ed Sheeran at Wembley was impressive. <sighs> Number 50. Interestingly, the term gladiator was only used to refer to someone who fought against other men. If you were fighting wild animals, you were called a bestiari which weirdly is my furry name. Odd. Number 51. According to experts, vendors would also sell sweat that they somehow collected from the gladiators in small souvenir pots. The women of ancient Rome would wear it to improve their beauty and complexion. I'm pretty sure these experts were having them on. Number 52. Not only that, ancient Romans also used to drink the blood of fallen gladiators, as they were under the gross misapprehension that the blood of these strong and fierce beings could cure epilepsy. Spoiler alert, by the way, it doesn't. Epilepsy specific. That's weird. Number 53. It's thought that if ancient Rome's Colosseum was built today, it would cost roughly $380 million. That is a lot of, and you know what I'm going to say here, chicken nuggets. That's right. Number 54. In fact, flooding stadiums for aquatic entertainment happen not as rarely as you might think. In the first century, the Romans even managed to acquire polar bears to fight seals in flooded amphitheaters. Okay, this is getting like a Pokemon battle now. Number 55. Another stadium, the Circus Maximus, was even larger. Largely dedicated to chariot racing, it measured 621 metres in length and held crowds of up to 150,000 people. Today, the building is almost entirely gone, but the space is now used as a public park. Number 56. Within chariot racing, participants were arranged into four factions, the Reds, Whites, Greens and Blues. Much like the sports teams of today, these teams inspired great loyalty to the point of true fanaticism. There were even clubhouses for each faction. Number 57. Research has discovered that some of the most celebrated Roman charioteers earned far more than even the best paid sports stars of today. One charioteer by the name of Gaius Apuleius Diocles managed to amass a fortune equivalent to $15 billion. Number 58. Ancient Rome was also home to a four story tall shopping centre that contained around 150 shops and offices. The complex was known as Trajan's Market, as it also housed the administrative offices of Emperor Trajan, who ruled between 98 to 117 AD. Number 59. Built in 118 AD, the Roman Pantheon remains the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. The Romans did not mess around when it came to unreinforced concrete domes, no siree. Number 60. Despite what you may assume about dwellings in ancient Rome, apartment buildings were fairly complex and could be up to nine stories high. Known as insulae, the upper stories were often more cramped and catered to ordinary citizens, whereas the lower floors were far more spacious and would feature lavatories, running water and heating. Who could imagine such a thing? Number 61. Ancient Roman aqueducts were so advanced and efficient, they were able to supply Rome with roughly 370 gallons of running water a second, which works out at around 11 billion gallons of water a year. This enabled the city to flourish because humans need water to live. Bonus fact for you there. Number 62. Roman sewers are understandably less celebrated, but in many ways were just as impressive. The Cloaca Maxima, literally meaning greatest sewer, was a sewer system built from the earlier Etruscan open drains and canals, and survived through the entirety of the Roman Republic and Empire. Part of the system is still used as a drain today. Number 63. Ancient Roman engineering even produced an early form of air conditioning. Wealthy citizens would run cold aqueduct water through the pipes in their homes, which helped to keep them nice and cool in the harsh Roman heat. Nintendo 64. The ancient Romans were the first people to use concrete on a large scale, having used it to create a number of impressive structures such as the Colosseum and the Pantheon, which are still standing today. The Romans first began building with concrete over 2,100 years ago on everything from aqueducts to monuments throughout the Mediterranean basin. Number 65. One of the most common cooking ingredients in ancient Rome was known as laser and was derived from a sylphium plant. The exact species of the plant is not known, but most experts believe it's extinct. One theory claims the ingredient was so delicious that the plant was harvested to extinction. It was that nice. Number 66. 
Ancient Rome is also known for the Vomitorium, a room in the houses of wealthy Romans where they would go and vomit so they could keep eating more lavish feasts. That's something an incorrect person would say. Mm. In reality, purging was actually not a regular part of Roman dining. The word Vomitorium simply referred to the entranceway through which crowds entered and exited a stadium. Number 67. Though they likely didn't habitually vomit to facilitate indefinite gluttony, ancient Romans did enjoy extravagant meals. A particular popular recipe known as the Trojan Pig called for whole pigs to be stuffed with fruit and sausages, then roasted and served on their feet. At the table, the pigs had their bellies split open, spilling its edible guts in front of diners. Number 68. Speaking of strange Roman dining customs, a popular delicacy in ancient Rome were the tongues of flamingos. They had the whole bird to choose from and they ate the tongue. But maybe I'm just being picky. Would you eat a flamingo tongue, by the way? Let me know in our YouTube part above. Number 69. Flamingo tongue. <laughs> the concept of a cheeky takeaway is far older than you may have previously assumed, you presumptuous cretins. Market and roadside stalls which sold food were common in ancient Rome, and some places even had counters that opened onto the street, known as thermopoliums, which customers would buy their food from to take away. Number 70. Ancient Rome also had public toilets, but by the sounds of them, using one wasn't a particularly pleasant experience. Not only were people expected to sit on long communal benches while they did their business, reminds me of Glastonbury, they also risked injury from fire due to the build-up of methane, as well as bites from creatures such as rats emerging from below. The bogs were so bad, prayers to the gods of fortune would often be found written on the walls. Number 71. Not only that, the sensitive issue of wiping was also dealt with in a manner that would send shivers coursing through every fibre on your body. Ready? When a person was done using the toilet, they cleaned themselves using a communal sponge tied to a stick. COMMUNAL sponge. Don't worry though, the sponge was rinsed in a bucket of salt water between uses. Hashtag gross, hashtag salty hole. Number 72. Even worse, Romans were forced to pay to use public toilets, much like commuters at many train stations and shopping centres in London, which is frankly a violation of my human rights. I mean, our human rights. Anyway, Romans were charged to use the public box because urine was actually a taxed commodity, owing to its value as a cleaning product because it contains ammonia. Gross. Number 73. So yes, urine was used as a cleaning product, most notably to wash clothes. Not only that, the ancient Romans even used urine to whiten their teeth. Oh, okay. Hard pass. Hard pass. Charcoal I'll use, but not we. Number 74. In ancient Rome, only freeborn Roman men were allowed to wear togas, which were worn as a symbol of their Roman citizenship. The Roman women wore a somewhat similar garment known as a stola, which were made from linen or wool, though wealthy women also had stolas made of silk. Number 75. Ancient Romans who ran for political office wore a distinctive toga known as the toga candida that was specifically whitened with chalk. This is where we get the word candidate, by the way. Number 76. The clothing of the average person in ancient Rome was the tunic, which consisted of two pieces of woolen fabric sewn together at the sides and shoulders, with openings for the arms and head. Number 77. In ancient Rome, a single pound of Tyrian purple dye cost three pounds of gold. It was so expensive because it was made from the secretions of sea snails. Yummy. 10,000 of which were needed to produce one gram of the dye. Number 78. As a result, purple clothing became a symbol of wealth and status, to the point that only emperors and senators were allowed to dress entirely in the colour. For anyone else to do so was considered treason. Number 79. In ancient Rome, women used opium-soaked tampons to relieve menstrual cramping. If you didn't know already, opium is the substance that's used to make heroin, so yeah, they weren't playing around. Number 80. Doctors in ancient Rome utilised a rudimentary form of electrotherapy for the treatment of neurological conditions like chronic migraines and epilepsy. Electrical charges were administered to patients by placing electro torpedo fish onto their heads, which seems, well, I'm not an expert, but seems dangerous. Really dangerous. Number 81. In ancient Rome, or AR as I call it, some citizens hired professional mourners who would follow the funeral procession while ripping at their hair and scratching their faces. Having a lot of these literal sad acts signified great wealth, which prompted an ever-increasing unofficial competition to see who could have the most mourners at their funeral. This escalated to a point that the government eventually had to impose a limit on how many people could have. Number 82. Some wealthy people would also hire an archimine, who would walk behind the body of the deceased and imitate them, copying their manners, gestures, and speech. I bet Jennifer Lawrence would be great at that role. In fact, she can do so when I die. Disappears into any role as Jay Law. Number 83. In AR, the punishment for patricide, i.e. killing one's father, was to be drowned in a sack along with a dog, a rooster, and a snake. Number 84. 
However, when public figures committed particularly grievous offences, such as treason or simply by bringing a Roman state into disrepute, the Senate could pass a sanction of damnatio memori, which literally means condemnation of memory. Images of offenders were removed from paintings and their name obliterated from public record, a punishment many considered worse than death itself. Number 85. In AR, Christians who betrayed other Christians to Roman authorities were known as traitors. It's because of these people that the English language has words like traitor and treason. Number 86. The highest ranking and rarest military decoration in ancient Rome was a simple crown made of grass, wheat and flowers. It was awarded to those whose actions saved the lives of an entire legion or even an entire army. Number 87. The Latin phrase libra pondo, meaning pound weight, was used in ancient Rome to indicate, well, weight. The first word has since been shortened to LB as an abbreviation for the pound measurement of weight. Number 88. The Salima porgy is a species of fish that A was probably picked on at school with a name like that, and B is a potent hallucinogenic when eaten. In ancient Rome, it was consumed as a recreational drug because some things never change. Number 89. The yin-yang symbol that is most commonly associated with China was actually first used in ancient Rome. The symbol first appeared in the Natitia Dignitatum, a document of the late Roman Empire that predates the first recorded Chinese versions by several hundred years. The two symbols are not thought to be related. Number 90. In ancient Rome, people that brought false accusations to court were branded on the forehead with the letter K, which stood for calumnia, meaning lie or falsehood. Totally fair, totally reasonable. Number 91. The ancient Romans also held an annual festival called Lupicalia, which was said to avert evil spirits, purify the city, and promote health and fertility. This was done by having two young men sacrifice a goat and smear its blood on their foreheads before stripping naked and running anti-clockwise around the city. Sounds like a party. Number 92. The Statue of Liberty, the giant green woman located at the mouth of the Hudson River in New York, was inspired by Libertas, the Roman goddess of liberty and freedom. Number 93. Likewise, the American city of Cincinnati is named after Cincinnatus, a Roman statesman and military leader who, after saving Rome from an invasion, immediately relinquished his power and retired to his farm rather than rule over the Republic. Number 94. Contrary to popular belief, the beautiful white statues from Roman antiquity were actually not white at all. These statues were actually painted in a variety of colours, rather than just being white stone or marble, and unfortunately, the paint jobs were just usually super tacky. Number 95. Salt was very favourable to the ancient Romans, and it was used not only to flavour and preserve food, but also made a good antiseptic. It was so prized, in fact, that Romans used to buy and sell slaves using salt. Imagine finding out you're only worth a sack of salt. Number 96. Because Romans were ultimately very silly people, they utilised something called temporal hours. Each day was divided into 24 hours, but in ancient Rome, there were always 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness, regardless of time of year. This meant that a daylight hour in the middle of the summer was considerably longer than those during the dead of winter. Yeah, stupid, right? Number 97. Many Roman emperors engaged in Mithridatism, a practice in which small amounts of poison are ingested over a long period of time in an attempt to gain immunity. Though this is effective for some poisons, for others you're basically just accumulating a lethal dose over time. Maybe just easier not to ingest poison? Just a thought. Number 98. In case you haven't realised already, the ancient Romans were a superstitious bunch and would often employ a variety of good luck charms to keep themselves safe. One popular symbol used to ward off evil spirits was the phallus, which is quite simply, in the most professional medical term possible, an erect penis. Yep, giggle if you want, but the ancient Romans loved penises. They wore phallus necklaces, hung phallus replicas in their doorways, inscribed them on paving stones, and even fashioned wind chimes in the shape of, well, you know, to protect themselves from evil. Number 99. In ancient Rome, the middle finger was known as the Digitus Impudicus, which translates as the indecent finger or the shameless finger. That it is. Egat, it's number 100! In ancient Rome, left-handed people were considered unlucky and untrustworthy. The prejudice was so significant that the English word sinister actually derives from the original Latin word for left. Number 101, hun. In ancient Rome, having a hooked nose was considered a sign of leadership. As a result, such noses with a prominent bridge are often called Roman noses. There you go, and that was 101 facts about ancient Rome. Did you enjoy yourself? Did you learn anything of yourself? What? I don't mean that. Did you enjoy yourself? Did you learn anything? Let me know in the comments down below. Who throughout time and space would you like us to look at next? Or what? Or why? Maybe not why. But let us know in the comments down below. Make sure you like and subscribe to this video. And there are two videos on screen now that I'm sure you're going to really dig. Until next time, I've been Sam. Bye.